welcome everybody to a really fun topic on how is it we should regulate platforms. Uh, several of us had the pleasure of actually being invited to comment on the new Digital Markets Act proposed by the European Union. Uh, and I have to give credit to our uh, co-panelists on that, uh, Luis Cabral, which is how cap um, and Thomas Belletti. And I'm here we're with, of course, uh, Jeffrey Parker and Yorgos Petropoulos. What we'd like to do is to give you a little bit of an overview of what happened with the Digital Markets Act, as well as our take on what some of the issues and challenges and solutions might actually be. So to describe the problem just a bit, what is the challenge with regulating platforms? Well, there are a variety of them. One of them is what defines the market for these uh, platforms? So we look at things like Google and are they in search? Are they in self-driving cars? Are they in um, you know, video? Uh, or if we take a look at Amazon, are they in cloud or books or uh, e-commerce and marketplaces or healthcare and whole foods? Uh, is another interesting question about that. Also, most of you probably know seven of the most uh, valuable firms in the world are platforms. These have become absolutely gigantic firms with enormous power in their particular marketplaces. Um, I believe that Google has something like 80% uh, search in the United States, 90% search in Europe. Uh, Amazon has two thirds uh, market share in um, electronic commerce. And it's not just the United States. If you take a look at what's happening, that's also true of, and it's even worse in uh, Tencent in China and Alibaba in China in terms of the market shares that they have. And then also, what are the legitimate tests? If you look at predation, for example, uh, we have uh, goods being given away for free. Well, that certainly doesn't pass the normal test of below marginal cost pricing. Uh, or if you get penetration pricing for uh, above marginal cost pricing, it really introduces some real uh, challenges to that. So we have this Digital Millennium um, or Digital Markets Act intended to regulate the behaviors of these firms and actually bring them into a little bit more parity. Even another example of it, when is it that these firms enter the markets uh, themselves that their partners have. It in some sense is the umpire calling balls and fouls for the game that they themselves are playing. So why is it that we should be able to regulate these firms and what's actually happening? So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff Parker and Yorgos Petropoulos who are with me. Uh, so Jeff, why don't you take it away? Marshall, great introduction. And, and uh, thank you, Christy and the Stanford team for having us aboard. Um, so in terms of what we think of as the policy origins of the Digital Market Act, you know, you ask, well, why do we need this focus on ex ante regulation? And in particular, this focus on very big platforms, or as we'll, we'll come to call them, gatekeeper platforms. Well, we've now seen decades of attempts to regulate some of the largest technology firms. And if you go back, for example, to some of the Microsoft actions from the 1990s, um, you'll see how far back in history this goes. Um, the challenge with ex post competition policy, that is waiting to see what the behavior is of a firm and then deciding whether or not that was anti-competitive is that they tend to be very, very slow. These actions can take on the order of a decade um, at the end of which the very situation um, that led to the action might well have changed. Um, they're often ineffective, and there's this kind of scrambled eggs problem, which is that the harm cannot always be undone. Um, and there's also a very heavy burden of proof on the competition authorities. And so as Marshall alluded to, you have this issue of what is a relevant market? Uh, that's a real challenge in some of the platform and technology firms. Um, what exactly are the theories of harm? Um, what are the remedies and how would you design them? And these are all particular challenges with big multi-sided platforms because the markets tend to interact. Um, so the way we think of the Digital Markets Act is that it should be viewed as comp complementary to competition policy. And so these ex ante obligations for the largest of the gatekeeper platforms would be viewed as a major objective in order to help have both consumer choice and autonomy um, amongst the different platforms that they might choose to participate on. And so it's a framework that authorities can have um, so that they can get direct access to platform data and information um, for the purposes of verifying that the platforms are doing what they say they are 
with respect to their own governance principles. And so as we worked through uh, the Digital Markets Act, one of our charges was basically to explain the economics behind the Digital Markets Act and then to comment on the proposal. And you know, the punchline is that we're in broad agreement with the vision in the DMA, but of course we do have some things to, to drill a little bit further down into. Um, some of the particular challenges are how to separate welfare gains um, from data-driven network effects, from welfare reductions coming from opportunistic and monopolistic platform behavior. Um, as I mentioned earlier, market definitions are particularly fuzzy, and that's actually a, a competitive feature um, or, or a normal competitive practice of platforms is that they have an easy way to enter adjacent markets leveraging their common user bases. Um, and then we're also very interested in issues of data and Marshall will go in a little bit into much more detail um, in terms of exclusive data access, asymmetric information and the market failures that result from that. Um, so with that, I think I'll hand it over to my colleague Yorgos um, who can go over some of the main features. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Hello, everyone. So, I mean, talking about uh, the main juror objective of the DMA, the Digital Market Acts, um, the way to ensure consumer choice and autonomy is to create contestable markets and fair markets where the value is distributed fairly across all the market participants. Uh, in order to do that, the regulation identifies some core platform services, for example, online marketplaces, search engines, social networks, video sharing platforms, platforms that provide services like interpersonal communication services or operating system, cloud computing, advertising. Uh, in which um, the, there can be uh, a justification for intervening due to uh, the existence of large gatekeepers, platforms that uh, can uh, are necessary gates for the ecosystem and reduce consumer choice, uh, and potentially they also create uh, problems to competition. Uh, how these platforms, how these gatekeepers are defined? Uh, the, the DMA puts specific uh, quantitative uh, measure criteria. Uh, they have to do with the annual turnover, uh, the market capitalization, as well as uh, the number of active monthly users, either on the business side or on the individual level, the consumer level. So for this particular gatekeepers that satisfy this criteria on this specific core services, uh, there is a list of uh, ex ante obligations that they need to respect. They need to respect when they operate in the market. Some of these obligations subject to further specification and there will be, uh, there will be concrete uh, proposals as we move forward. Uh, and these obligations uh, apply um, for uh, uh, only with one exception. Uh, they the platforms, uh, they have the right to, um, ex uh, to be exempted from particular obligations when compliance with the danger economic viability of the, of the platform, of the gatekeeper, or if the impact of, on third parties uh, is uh, proven to be negative. So uh, if there is um, very sufficient proofs, uh, if there are sufficient proofs that that is the case, uh, then the obligations will not apply to the, those particular uh, platforms for which we identify these problems. And with that, I, I give the floor to Marcel again. So um, let's touch on some of the data issues in that, because the data is one of the critical assets available for uh, these network firms. As a matter of fact, it's one of the principal resources that have shifted the nature of the economy, which used to be run, if you look at the largest firms, the prior firms were based on, uh, the giants were based on energy or finance, rival resources, whereas information uh, is data is a non-rival resource, uh, which leads to one of the things that Jeff and I've been calling these inverted firms. And there's much that I actually think we need to be thinking about in terms of data as the asset driving what's happening with these giant antitrust style uh, firms. So the first point is simply think of data 
economies of scale and scope. As you can actually improve the recommendations on one uh, product, you can and observe the behaviors for one uh, individual. You can then improve the experience for others, creating network effects, spillover value across others, which is a in some sense a pro-competitive use. You're creating welfare. It's a good thing. These network effects create value for larger ecosystems. So participation begets value, which begets participation, which begets value, and that in a sense is welfare enhancing. Um, so we want to increase the social value of this. A problem, however, is the privileged access to that data. Uh, I, I can tell you, as an author on Amazon, I can't access my own data. Jeff and I can't get access to our own, and many of the merchants can't get access to their own data. So Amazon or others or Google or Facebook have privileged access to this overview data of the market, and they can cherry pick where to enter, where to compete, and actually squeeze the products of others. It's ironic in that antitrust regulators want competition generally, but in this case, it's only competition from the platform itself, and it's not fair to other third parties or other ways of gaining granting access to that in a more, um, more robust or more equitable fashion. So what is the DMA proposing uh, to solve some of these problems? One, they're uh, uh, arguing that you, these platforms should refrain from combining data sets across different things. So this would be data uh, from WhatsApp to Facebook to Instagram, unless there's an opt out provision. So you can combine it, but you have to give users a way to opt out. Another is to prohibit use of that data uh, by the platform itself uh, for competing with its business uh, users, unless the data is also publicly available. This is an interesting one where um, they give you a little bit of commentary it may be a good idea to prevent it uh, initially, but perhaps you want to give everyone equal footing later. That is, give everyone access to that, not just the platform, but to give it to others later. And that's not a provision of the Digital uh, Markets Act. So uh, we think it'd be more like a patent period would be a better way to handle this. A third one is to give the same kinds of GDPR rights on data portability that we have for individuals for businesses. So you might gain portability, you might gain open access to that data. This is an area where um, we, you know, Yorgos, Jeff and I, diverge from the Digital Markets Act. We actually think that we have a better recommendation. So let me see, pause for a moment. So the Digital Markets Act proposes data portability because what does it do? It presumably helps create competition. It gives users rights in their data. It gives them the ability to pull it from one platform to another. As an example, a merchant might take their reviews that they earned on Amazon and move it to another platform, weakening the lock-in, which you would hope would be pro-competitive. This introduces, however, several different kinds of problems. In that specific instance, imagine it also introduces moral hazard. Merchants might be able to pull their data off of Amazon, but then only post the five-star reviews and drop all the one- and two-star reviews. That's not necessarily great. Another element is you remove data from uh, context. There was a wonderful study done by the program of a web where they tried to download under GDPR individual Facebook data. But what happens? It loses context. If you respond to someone else's post, that's their data, so Facebook doesn't give it to you. So it loses the context when you pull it out. A third element, it decays. It's one-time stop. So it doesn't have the flow rate of recent data. It obsolesces. And a fourth problem, it's not actionable. If you take it off the platform where it's useful, you can't make a purchase, you can't make a post, others can't give you benefits from that. So for a variety of reasons, there's some complications from data portability. Hence, we've proposed something we call giving users an in situ right, which is you get permission to give others access to your data and use it where it's resident. This way, you could allow Facebook data to give Google uh, access your Amazon data and maybe get you recommendations based on the books that you purchased, or maybe they could recommend, Amazon could recommend books based on the friends that you have, or you could cross post. You could get advertisers to compete with one another and create benefits on your behalf, and it's all your permission. It gets even better though, because suppose that someone misbehaves, you could turn off that permission and they lose access to the data. Or with data portability, you can never really know that it was destroyed after you turned off access. They might have to have it, whereas here you're turning it off. And again, it gives you a deeper right. So we've argued for a new right, not currently present in the Digital Markets Act or any place else, which we're calling an in situ right, which gives you the privilege to use your data where it's resident, 
which solves the moral hazard problem, the obsolescence problem, uh, and also the, the uh, third party access problem as well. So it's a really interesting model, we think, of an improvement over the Digital Markets Act. Um, a couple of other things we're recommending based on the panel is also perhaps some technological and legal Chinese walls in here. So imagine another possibility is that you separate the vertical services on top from the infrastructure on the bottom. In that case, Google or Facebook or Amazon might then, when it offers a service on top of the infrastructure, would have to compete on exactly the same terms for its own division as third party divisions. In this case, third parties then have equal footing in terms of access to the infrastructure or the pricing or the data or the customers. So it becomes harder to engage in self preferencing uh, in this case. So we think this helps to address some of the self preferencing issues. You create a technological and legal interface and publish the same terms under which everybody gains access to the underlying infrastructure. And again, we think we can actually do somewhat better than uh, some of the data portability issues inspired by GDPR as a uh, complement to the European proposals, this is actually analogous to some of the privileges granted under Payment Services Directive 2 or PSD2. So what we're doing is we're generalizing a property for extant legislation and trying to empower users in novel ways. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, Yorgos to take it even further in some of the merger issues uh, around uh, platforms and antitrust. Uh, thank you, Marcel. So uh, if you are talking about mergers, uh, there are some concerns that uh, we see in digital ecosystems. Um, concerns, for example, that have to do with killer acquisitions or kill zones by the big platforms. Um, killer acquisitions refer to the situation in which the acquisition takes place uh, in order to prevent future competition, prevent a future potential competitor uh, to grow and uh, take over the market. Kill zones refer to the situation in which uh, when I enter a new market, in which, um, in which uh, 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 through the acquisition of a firm there that supply specific services, uh, then um, the other competitors in that market, they have less incentives to innovate or they find more difficult to, fi to finance investments in innovation, creating a kill zone. So uh, super big platforms, when they enter in new uh, markets through uh, mergers, or uh, when they buy uh, competitors that have already some installed bases, uh, there, may, um, there may have such negative effects. Um, so, uh, what can we do that to address it and what the Digital Markets Act suggests? So the Digital Markets Act, um, uh, because we have some under enforcement in that space, uh, they set the merger notification threshold to zero. All the platforms that they are classified as gatekeepers, they are obliged to report all their mergers and acquisitions. In this way, authorities uh, can uh, uh, investigate all the mergers if they want, if they have the capacity to do that, but at least they have uh, better information on the specific markets that uh, big platforms target and the um, uh, specific competition concerns that they are generated from such merger strategies. Uh, so in the panel, we had an extensive uh, discussion about this issue. And um, we concluded that uh, the economic implications of large platform mergers are ambiguous. They can incorporate efficiency gains that so they are very welcome for the digital ecosystem and especially consumers, but they can also generate competitive threats. Uh, the vast majority of mergers seem to be complements and not substitutes. They add uh, a complementary value to already existing services without uh, generating so serious competition effects. Kill zone effect probably um, is one of uh, the valid concerns in terms of competition, but um, overall its impact on innovation is not so clear. Um, there is an ongoing debate on putting the burden of proof on the gatekeeper um, in, to prove that the merger 
uh, uh, merger strategies, it, it is against bring sufficient uh, efficiency uh, gains to, uh, to counterbalance the comp competitive concerns. Um, this debate is um, uh, a, a very valid one, and there are many different approaches uh, proposed uh, on how to address this burden of proof issue. Um, I will give the floor now to Jeff uh, to talk about lock-in in mobile ecosystems. All right. Thank you, Yorgos. So I want to talk a bit about mobile ecosystems, and in particular about the current duopoly between the Google-sponsored Android system and the Apple-sponsored iOS system. Um, you know, for a while, we had three with the Microsoft system, but um, that didn't thrive. And so currently, it looks as though that market structure um, is going to be a duopoly, although, of course, there are some interesting things happening in China uh, that could end up altering that landscape. Um, but if we stick with this duopoly framework, uh, let's look at the mobile ecosystem for a moment. Um, what you have are multiple interlinked platforms. You've got the phone itself um, and then its operating system. You've got the apps that are hosted on top of that operating system and then extend the functionality of the handsets. And then within the apps themselves, you often have extra services um, that have in-app sales. And the contested issue here is to what degree should the platform sponsor be able to participate not only in the one-time revenue of an app sale, but the recurring revenue of say subscriptions that those in-app sales comprise. Um, and that's been a, an area that we've seen lawsuits and lots of news and, and sort of an interesting um, debate both policy as well as kind of the power of the ecosystem uh, emerge. So if you look, the, the operating system owner gets to set conditions of all aftermarkets um, and then all the consumers and producers um, because of switching costs, adoption costs and network effects actually have a significant amount of lock-in. And so what are the concerns that the DMA is trying to address here? Well, one is that you see monopolistic access pricing by the platform sponsors um, to the extent where you're maintaining 30% um, say taxes. Um, so a fair bit of the debate in the panel was around what's, what's uh, reasonable there. And obviously we're not gonna be in the business of setting price like a regulator, but we did ask the question about where is the value add of the platform and how is that being created? And of course, many platforms generate value by matching supply and demand. And that's an incredibly important feature where they're able to get the right supply to the right demand that creates the most value. And so of course they should participate in capturing some of that value. But then the question you ask is once that match has been created, um, what are the ongoing value add um, sort of streams that the platform is creating that would justify uh, a continuing high fraction, say, of aftermarket sales. Um, so it was those types of debates that the panel was having, trying to understand sources of value creation and then sources of value capture. Um, because, of course, there are sig significant conditions on developers um, in order for them to even access an app store and a phone. Um, and in many ways, this kind of uh, uh, goes back to some of the content um, that we looked at on tying and bundling. And in particular, um, there's a defense from the Chicago School, which basically says, look, there's one monopoly profit. And it doesn't matter if you bundle or tie, there's only one place that you can extract monopoly profits. However, if you dig into that argument, and some of our colleagues have been looking at this for decades, and Barry Nailbuff um, has published quite extensively on that, and we relied upon some of that background. Um, you'll see that that theorem depends upon some very restrictive conditions that we don't actually see in, pro in, uh, in practice. So for example, um, we actually see quite limited competition and high switching costs in the primary device markets. 
um, we see a high degree of uncertainty about aftermarket prices, quantity, and quality. And we see the ability to meter the usage so that you actually can price discriminate based upon the intensity of usage um, of any particular product and service. Um, so where did this come down in the DMA? Well, there were a number of, of sort of features directed um, at this mobile operating system. And so one, for example, is to require that businesses be allowed to sell the same products through third-party services. Um, another is to allow businesses to promote offers to end users outside of the core platform. Uh, then there are issues around bundling and tying where there's a requirement that end users be allowed to uninstall pre-installed software um, and to allow ancillary service providers access to all of the operating system features and to apply fair and non-discriminatory access conditions for developers to gain access to app stores. Um, so we weighed all of this and you know, our opinion, um, you know, as is often the case is we're going to need to do some more here um, to really clarify um, what these, what these uh, sections are going to mean in practice. Um, so the Digital Markets Act is really betting on competition between app stores to reduce these market access fees. Um, we asked ourselves, well, how, how likely is that um, given that network effects can prevent competition and also you end up with these adverse selection problems where if you have a reputation for maintaining quality, you'll actually end up attracting most of the demand side. And we've seen that in the case of Android app stores in China. Um, so that then led us to questions of whether these were more like a, a telecom that actually needed direct price regulation or whether it was possible to foster enough competition um, to reduce what we would view as, as sort of high ongoing um, fees that the, uh, that the platform operators are extracting. Um, other questions that we ask, and this will sort of bear further analysis um, or will require further analysis is who benefits from competition? Is it going to be the largest players in games and social media or will it be the smaller players? Um, that's important because if your sort of goal is, <clears throat> that's important because if your goal is to foster innovation, then you could care mightily about the longer tail of smaller players and you don't wanna have the unintended consequence of potentially harming them. Um, we also have a number of definitional issues to work through. Um, what is an app store? You know, what is an operating system? And, you know, we all think that we know the answers to these, but as we've seen with the rise of these kind of super apps um, that are aggregating lots of different functions, features, um, and technical capabilities, um, these things can be pretty blurred. And as a result, we ask the question of how far will we be able to extend the application of the obligations under the Digital Markets Act? Um, so I guess the punchline on this one is um, we know some but we're, we're going to have to kind of see how these markets unfold um, and then offer further guidance as we learn more. So with that, I think I'll hand it over to my colleague, Georgos, to talk about tying and bundling. So tying and bundling are practices that we observe in platform ecosystems. Uh, probably a famous case, recent case, uh, is uh, the Google Android case, uh, where uh, Google bundled uh, the uh, license of uh, Google Play uh, with the pre-installation of applications like uh, Google Search or uh, its browser application, uh, Google Chrome. Uh, manufacturers in order to get uh, Google Play in their devices. They had to pre-install those two applications. So uh, bundling and tying refers to many forms and we see in the online ecosystem, many examples of uh, bringing two different services, applications, products together and um, offer them, selling them together. And in fact, uh, this is not a new practice. 
uh, we have uh, we have seen um, also in traditional markets such strategies to take place. And if we look at the economic impact um, and we study the welfare effects, um, we can conclude that they are ambiguous. Um, they may uh, serve in a competitive function. For example, through buying and tying, uh, we can have a leverage of market power from one market to another, from one product on the other by bringing them together. I use a popular product in order to attract uh, consumers for another product that is not so, so uh, popular. Uh, but um, since um, if you are talking about consumer preferences that they are complementary across uh, different products, there may be also serious efficiency gains. So it's not clear uh, what uh, is the overall and final welfare impact. Um, another strategy which is close to tying a bottling is uh, uh, the self-preferencing, which already Marcel mentioned. And actually, uh, this uh, strategy is observed uh, exactly because we see that platforms uh, are uh, vertically uh, integrated structures. They uh, offer intermediate services, but at the same time, uh, they also offer products and services uh, to final uh, consumers. So self-preferencing refers to the case when I visit a marketplace and um, uh, the intermediary, the marketplace, promotes to me uh, its own products and services in expense of the competitors. Uh, so those uh, two uh, categories of strategies uh, can create benefits, but they can also create competitive cons uh, concerns. And uh, uh, the Digital Market Act uh, in incorporates some provisions, some obligations that they are relevant. Uh, first of all, um, uh, one obligation is that platforms, the gatekeepers, should refrain from self-preferencing in uh, rankings of alternatives. Uh, they should also refrain from restricting the ability of users to switch services. Um, and uh, they uh, should allow providers of uh, services to access the same features as the gatekeepers uh, own vertical subsidiary. So the attention is given to provide um, the business users uh, the freedom uh, to be able to move uh, from one platform to the other, to communicate to the other side, the consumers, through multiple channels. Um, and this is something we also um, see in the obligations that they are more relevant to time and battling. For example, we have the obligation that uh, gatekeeper platforms should refrain from requiring users to subscribe to more services uh, that are provided by the gatekeeper as a condition to access the core platform service. I want to enter a marketplace to reach uh, consumers, I want uh, to be visible in uh, uh, online search. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this service, this core service by the platform should not come with conditions to consume some of the other platform services. Um, so um, also, in, also in this uh, way, we, we see that the DMA puts specific attention to the freedom of business users uh, to be able to use alternatives in the online ecosystem in order to operate and provide their own services and not being uh, directed only uh, to one platform and consume only the services of this platform as they move forward in their effort to raise demand. So what should we do with tying, battling, and self-preferencing them? So since the welfare implications should, uh, are ambiguous, uh, the opinion of the panel, uh, and based on the, an economic analysis of the strategies, um, we should, um, we should um, put them in a gray list. What does it mean, a gray list? A gray list means that um, they can be presumed that they're competitive, but uh, platforms, uh, they, may, uh, they can be allowed to come forward with sufficient evidence of the pro-competitive effects of these strategies 
uh, given their business model and the specificities of the environment they operate. So um, this is uh, a form of efficiency defense, which is part of competition law, um, where the burden of proof of this efficiency defense are attached to the platform, the gatekeeper platform. Um, a particular uh, note on self-preferencing. Self-preferencing is uh, hard to, uh, to be proven in practice. Um, we have seen that in the Google Shopping case of the European Commission, it took more than six years for this case uh, to arrive to the first uh, decision before uh, going to the courts uh, by the European Commission. Um, and that also suggests uh, that um, uh, some difficulties um, with these particular strategies make competition law and enforcement slower. Um, and uh, there um, we need to empower the authorities with the ability to assess the impact of self-preferencing. And um, one avenue is uh, to give to the authorities the possibility uh, to run behavioral experiments with uh, platforms algorithms um, and potentially use uh, relevant data sets either from the platform or uh, also outside of the pla platform in order to assess whether the algorithms are biased towards platform services uh, and in uh, uh, the expense of third party providers uh, creating this um, unfair competition uh, in the upstream level. Uh, so um, the, the way forward is challenging. The European experiment is an interesting one. It's uh, the first full regulated uh, uh, proposal for regulation, which um, try to assess specific uh, practices uh, that we see in uh, platforms, but also um, provides a framework which will empower authorities uh, to get access to platforms, data, and algorithms in order to be able uh, to run such behavioral experiments uh, in which in the digital age uh, are particularly important to understand the implications of big platform strategies and their potential welfare and anti-competitive effects. Thank you. So one of the important areas uh, that the Digital Markets Act is seeking to clarify um, is really what are businesses allowed to do? What are they not allowed to do? And what are the sort of intermediate zones? And if you think from um, sort of a compliance point of view, uh, that's really important. Uh, so the Digital Markets Act actually set out a whole set of what we'll call a white list of permitted activities. Um, and Conversely, it set out a blacklist of things that are clearly prohibited, such as self-preferencing, um, where you disadvantage your ecosystem partners, taking advantage of your privileged position as a platform. Um, and then they also laid out a gray list, um, which as Yorgos mentioned earlier, is this notion that we're going to assume that these activities are anti-competitive, but we could envision an argument under which they could be pro-consumer. And so the burden of proof is then put upon the company that wants to undertake such an activity. And so certain bundling and tying uh, practices would fall under that gray list. Now, critically, the question is, who does all this apply to? Um, a lot of the Digital Markets Act um, is aimed directly at what is being called a gatekeeper platform. Um, but that can be a bit of a tough definition. Um, clearly, there's concern in Europe over the rise of the giant technology firms, both in the US and in China. And in many ways, some of these uh, sort of regulations could be tailored, you know, could be viewed as designed specifically um, to regulate those entities. But of course, fairness dictates that those definitions be broadly applied um, to any firm. And so I think with that, uh, I'll invite Marshall uh, to discuss sort of the panel's thoughts on what a gatekeeper definition really is. So uh, well, let's just touch briefly on how the DMA has defined them. Um, with, given that platforms cross so many different industries, whether you look at social networks 
or operating systems or e-commerce marketplaces where you're talking about interactions or search or um, uh, uh, you know, social networks. Rather than trying to pick industries, they tried to pick size definitions. So I believe, uh, I believe the numbers are something like 45 million users and 10,000 businesses associated with the program might help to define uh, a gatekeeper clap, uh, platform. Um, or do they have a strong economic position that actually is not just in the internal market, but then spans multiple EU markets? Uh, do they have a strong intermediation position, matching between users and users or merchants to other users? Um, and lastly, do they have an entrenched or durable position? Have they been there for multiple years? Uh, so it's clear that they're stable uh, within that position. Uh, one of the things that we'd set back on in commentary on uh, that position is maybe size definitions aren't the best way. Maybe a better way to look at that is the interactions. What's the right unit of analysis? What is the amount of value that is being intermediated uh, by this platform? How do we, can we count those interactions? What's the nature of those interactions? The interactions then become the market share as distinct from the product market share, which we think might actually be a better way of looking at this very specific problem. So I think there are other definitional questions that we need to raise about how uh, the DNA should be interpreted. Um, so one question that does arise is what this means for global competition amongst the technology giants. Um, and, you know, at some level, you might say, well, clearly a region um, that hasn't had sort of the same level of technology firm growth, um, specifically Europe, uh, would be particularly concerned about that and would then ask the questions, well, what have we done from a policy point of view um, that might actually have inhibited the growth of these firms? Um, and now that they've grown, uh, are there issues where they're restricting innovation and the potential rise of sort of more local or regional firms. Um, I, we don't have a strong answer on whether the DMA is actually going to achieve sort of those unstated policy goals, because if applied fairly, you know, in any specific industry where you see the growth, um, say, to where you reach the, the, the status of a gatekeeper platform, um, that'll have to be fairly applied. Uh, so, Ooh. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm going to jump in for a second and say it is really interesting. Uh, how you pose the question gives you very different answers. So one thing we do have is an opinion on how sometimes these work and how sometimes these don't. We have some really interesting evidence from GDPR, right, the General Data Privacy uh, Directive. There, similar goals were to uh, restore users' rights and also to create competition. And to some extent, they were successful in some and failures in others. So giving users rights and data portability or giving rights and access to their own data, in some sense, that was a success. But in terms of creating competition, that was actually a failure. We actually have data that you have entrenched the bigger incumbents uh, by requiring these conditions to access uh, other data. And they already have complementary data from which they can create scope, which is actually um, giving them increased market share relative to the small players that have less to bargain with access to your data. In general, we think the right question to ask is, how do you create wealth as opposed to how do you create privacy? Then when, once you've created the wealth, then we have a different question about who gets it. What we think is we need better mechanisms to then share that back after we've created that. So there's some really interesting uh, questions about how you phrase the problem gives you different answers with different solutions. And we've already seen this with GDPR. Interestingly, and let me dovetail on Marshall's GDPR comment, um, Payment Services Directive 2 uh, was also designed to foster innovation in the, in the fintech kind of arena. Um, and that's where by user um, sort of agreement, one firm is able to get access to a financial services firm uh, to enact, uh, basically to take action, say make payments on a user account. Now the concern is Yes, you've enabled the innovation to come from startups and fintechs, but you've also created the avenue for large firms to enter other large firms markets, and in particular, the large technology firms. Um, so that's an area where it could be an, an unintended consequence um, of a valuable goal, which is to foster greater innovation. 
thank you very much for hosting this forum and for giving us a chance uh, to talk about the work that we've done over the last several months. I mean, it's a real honor to get to be asked by the European Commission um, to help in what we think is an absolutely critical process of trying to understand the economy and the ways that it's changing, and then to think about the appropriate regulatory responses um, within the context of what we know as academics and as economists. So we'd also like to thank you for joining us. Let me just jump in and add, um, if you have any questions on it, please let me invite you to read uh, the report. So you should be able to find a link uh, adjacent to this video, which features uh, on the one hand, the expert panel's report itself, which summarizes the views on the, uh, the DMA. And then also there should be a link to our own new proposals on the in situ rights that we would like to grant users to expend, extend your ability to create value indeed on your own behalf. So with that, let me thank you from my part and pass it on to your guys. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, those are important issues for competition, for democracy, for the future. And we'll be delighted to hear your thoughts and your questions.